Before I start this sermon, I need to offer a sermon correction. I, it was pointed out that uh, I uh, mixed my uh, example when I was talking about um, school schedules and how that shows some of the pressure of, of the culture on the church. I, 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 ta- I conflated, or I combined uh, the school sports and the league sports or the select sports that you choose to be part of, and that was inaccurate on my part, and I apologize. That was uh, unfortunate of me. So... Oh, any other mistakes I made in sermons recently? Just go ahead and cop to all of them all at once. Okay. You never know. <laughs> so if someone comes up to you and asks you, how would you describe Jesus? What would be the adjectives you would use? Loving. Loving. Messiah. Messiah. We can wrap Messiah up with God. That's a package deal there. What else? Forgiving. 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 I heard something else? Jehovah. Jehovah, yes. That's uh... Loving. Loving? Yep. Abraham said trusting. Trusting. And I would put with that, trustworthy. Teacher. Teacher. Leader. What's that? Leader. Leader, Leader, yeah. Healer. Healer. And did I hear pray? Pray. And Betty, you're raising your hand, so you're, you're so wonderful. Yes. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. I'm putting all the descriptions that are sort of God together. And there are some others. Uh, forgiving. Did I put a forgiving? Uh, reconciling, which is part and parcel with forgiving. Um, he put up with a lot of frustrations to the disciples, so I'd probably throw out patient. Anything else you want to add? Gracious. Merciful. Merciful. What's up? Everlasting. Everlasting. Let's see. I made my own list to just make sure we didn't miss anything. Uh, Humble. Which goes with sort of the servant attitude. Master. Master. And then I thought there was one more. Uh, Yeah, prophetic. Telling the truth. When if something's wrong, Jesus would say, this is messed up. So, is this a pretty good description of Jesus? We, we, We like this, sir? I'm going to bracket off all the stuff that's about being God, but the Master, Messiah, God, Jehovah, Emmanuel, and everlasting. But all the rest, does that describe you? We follow Jesus, right? That, that's the thing. We decide to follow Jesus. We follow in his footsteps. And then, as Paul says, we, we talks about putting on Christ, becoming more Christ-like day by day. And, and so we... This is our, our this is our task, right? For the rest of our lives, once we decide to follow Jesus, we are called to follow in His footsteps and become gracious, merciful, humble, prophetic, teacher, wise, trustworthy, forgiving, reconciling, patient, and uh, that's quite a list, isn't it? As we make this choice to follow Jesus, as this becomes our, our goal, this becomes the template for where we're going. I'm going to observe something that is kind of obvious here. Some of us are better at this than others, right? Is that, can we agree on that? Yeah. We, as you look around, we are at varying levels of maturity and how, how closely we resemble Jesus, how closely we look like this. And, and it's not just that overall we're at varying levels of maturity. And let me just say right now, I'm not at all making the claim to be the most mature person in the room. I'm not. But it also varies by specific attribute. 
Some of us are very forgiving, but don't want to stand up and tell the truth and be prophetic and say, you know what, this is messed up. Some of us are very quick to stand up and say, we have to do something about this, but we aren't patient worth a lick. All right, you see how that combination's happened. There are some of us who are great at praying, are not gracious, or we're very merciful, but I mean, it's, we're all an interesting mix of being really good at some of this and not so good at others. And we're all striving to follow the same Lord, to follow this towards this same goal. But, but that, that's the situation we find ourselves in when we gather here as the church. And, and I'm sure you've heard this description of the church, that this is not the gathering of the saints, but the hospital for sinners. You heard that before, this is a hospital for sinners. I like that because it makes the point that we don't get together because we're perfect. But the more I thought about that and I thought about this, I realized I don't think hospital is quite the right term. I think this is more like physical therapy. Because what happens when you go to the hospital? You go to the hospital and you point at something and you say, hey, it's broke. And then what do they do? They fix it. And then you go home and who did it? They did. The doctors and the nurses. And Dr. S. Meyer, thank you. Uh, and, and Trudy and all the others. We think, and it's wonderful, right? That, but if that's what we do at church, if we come to church because the church is the hospital, then you're coming here, so like, I'm the doctor and I'm going to fix you, and you come to me and say, Andy, you know, I'm not very forgiving, could you fix me? And then I send you home an hour later and you're forgiving? Wouldn't that be nice? That's not what happens, is it? No, it's really not. And, and, don't even try, and that would make me the doctor and i got my own problems. But, uh, bad idea. I think physical therapy is a lot better way to think about what's happening right now. Who here has done physical therapy? Yeah, yeah, you, you all know how this goes. You go to physical therapy and you sit down and, and, and what do they do? You, your knee is messed up and, and it can't flex all the way. What do they do? They hurt you. They hurt you, right? They flex it. They flex, and you go, that hurts. And they say what? Good. They flex it till it hurts. You get a little bit more flexible. And then you go home and what do you do? You go back to, in two days and they flex it again. And you say, well, that hurts more. Good. And then you go home, but the goal, the product is you can flex, you can move, you can do things you couldn't do. And so we're not here because I'm the doctor to cure your ills. We're here for sort of a spiritual physical therapy so that you can flex your forgiveness. You can test your ability to reconcile. You can become a little bit more patient and the next week even maybe a little bit more patient than that, right? That's we're here together, not because we're perfect, we're here because we have some places we're not quite done yet, and we're here to be flexed and pushed, and it might hurt a little bit more, and it, that's is very true of me as well. And, and so, we're never really done with this either. Did you ever hear someone say, you know what, as soon as I had a kid, or I got married, or I retired, that my life became easy? that everything got simple, that I never fought again, I never had problems with forgiveness. You know, as soon as I hit this point, I never had a problem with being this. It doesn't happen, right? We are always needing to be stretched in some aspect of, of this. We're always having more that we need to, to work on, to be pushed in. It, it's the rest of our lives that we're doing this. It, and it's to this problem, this challenge, that, um, that Paul speaks this week. Paul speaks this week, and what he says, it, what he's doing as he's writing this, this letter, it's not really a letter. What he's writing is a sermon that will then be spoken to the entire church, preached to the entire church. And uh, he's writing to a church that's at varying levels of maturity, and, and he has to address a couple issues, two in particular, that he knows there's a problem with. And he knows that some people are doing a really good job and some people are not. I'm trying very hard not to make eye contact, not trying to make any assumptions or judgments here. But he has to figure out how to do this gracefully. And so he has this phrase. He says, more and more. You, you who are doing this, may you continue to do it more and more. You who are already doing, you who are already doing really good at this, just, just keep on doing it. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, those who aren't, you might want to start, right? And so he gets into the, these two topics. First, he talks about how we as Christians receive the gift of sexuality. Evidently, something has happened. We don't know what it is, but he responds. But he says, more and more, those of you who are keeping your pants on, keep your pants on. And those who are married, stay married. 
That, that, that's sort of the short, he takes all of like the Old Testament wisdom on marriage, he boils it down, there it is. What's the Bible say about marriage? Keep your pants on or get married and stay married. And uh, more and more do that, and hint, hint, nudge, nudge, if you're not, you might want to start. And then he moves on to talk about work. He says that uh, so there are some people in the work who are kind of being bums. They're not working. They're bumming off other people, letting them work, and then, then eat, eating off other people's uh, pro productivity. And, and Paul encourages the entire church, more and more may you work with your hands and lead a quiet life. And it's not quiet in that you never speak up. It's quiet in that you never have to speak up and say, hey, I need help all the time. And so it's sort of more and more work, because that is what God has given you to do. And for those of you who need to get off your duffs and get working, you might want to start. And so the context, in context, what this becomes is, it's not saying don't help anyone, that the church should not help anyone. It's saying, if you're in the church, you better be doing your own work before you dare ask for help. Now, do these two matters really apply here? Does God really need someone to, to hear me say, keep your pants on today, or you need to work harder? Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> I think what we do need to attend to is the way that in which Paul is speaking to this church, dealing with the, the reality that differing people are at differing levels of, of maturity, especially with differing aspects of what it means to follow Jesus. The way that uh, Paul deals with this gracefully, saying, more and more, may you continue to do this. Whatever aspect of, of Christian discipleship you're ta he's talking about, just more and more, keep on keeping on. And, and he's saying this to a church that has made a long-term commitment to each other. Because when you join a church, what you're joining is a group of people who are going to walk together knowing that we're not perfect, that all of us have varying levels of maturity, and that we're never going to walk in. It'd be great to walk into a meeting or a worship or an event and have everyone be perfect and we all just get along and everything goes perfectly. But every time we are gathered, we are, it is entirely possible we're, we're going to run into some way in which one of us is weak and one of these. And so what we're saying, what Paul is encouraging us to do is to walk together knowing that more and more all of us need to strive to grow in this. And I want to point out what, when this does happen, when we run into each other's weaknesses, when we run into times when we're not patient or forgiving or humble. Uh, you ever heard someone say, you know, I can't believe a Christian would be like that. Or I can't believe the church would do that. You ever hear someone say that? It, it happens, right? You can't believe a Christian would teach. I can believe it happens because I know we're all sinners. But what I also believe, and this is, I think, essential about what Paul is teaching here, I also believe that the Holy Spirit can change people's lives and that we are all growing in this and that in as much as we are committed to walking together, we can turn to a future where people's lives are changed. When we, when we have problems or conflicts and we walk away, what we're saying is that the problem we just had is bigger than God's ability to fix it. And that, that's a dangerous place to be, right? You start saying something, or there are bigger problems than God can fix, that gets dicey. When we have problems together, the problems that happen are because we're not as mature as we might be, and we need to work with each other gracefully to get there, to turn to a future where the Holy Spirit can transform us. Now, Paul does say a little bit more about the future. Uh, he talks in the second half of our reading, what he does is he talks about the second coming, uh, about Jesus coming again. And the interesting thing about this is up till now in the letter, he has been saying again and again, as you know, as you learn from us, you yourselves know. Have you caught this? He keep, what he's doing in this letter is reminding people of what he's already taught them until he gets to here. And here he starts out by saying, I do not want you to be uninformed. Which means what? They were uninformed. And so he has had months to teach them what it means to follow Jesus. Months to form them as a church, and then he had to leave unexpectedly. So he didn't cover everything. But when you have a certain amount of time to cover a certain amount of material, what do you cover first? What's most important, right? And so he's covered what's most important. He has covered following Jesus, forgiveness, reconciliation, how to live together. You really do need to work. He's covered all these details. And you know what he didn't get to before he left? What happens after the resurrection? 
He had talked about it, but here he's telling them, I don't want you to be uninformed because he hadn't told them about it yet. It tells you a little bit about Paul's priorities. His first priority when teaching a new Christian was not to talk about what happens after death. His first priority was to teach them about who Jesus is and how do you live in this life. And then he goes on to tell them, he says, uh, those who have fallen asleep in the Lord, will not, we will not precede them in getting to the kingdom of God, getting to heaven. We don't have a clue when it's going to happen. We don't know where it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And then he moves on. He doesn't really give a lot of detail. He just says, it's going to happen, it'll be good, we don't know when, let's move on. And then he moves on to say, encourage each other and buckle down and live as people who live in the light, not in the darkness. And then he wraps up this chunk of the letter. It's amazing how little he talks about what happens after death because it's important to him. He does say in another letter, to live as Christ, to die as gain, but he just doesn't focus or obsess about it. And then Paul moves on. Next week we'll finish up this, this uh, letter to the Thessalonians and then next month we'll go to uh, Jeremiah. So we're not going to find out what happens next. So I, need to give, I want to give you a small glimpse of what happens. Because there's a second letter, right? We have 1 Thessalonians and he's responding to some problems. And we have 2 Thessalonians. It's sort of the update. It's the next chapter. And what we find out is that uh, he says a little bit more about the second coming, which is cool. He doesn't say anything else about keeping your pants on. Evidently that problem's been nipped in the bud which is cool. And then he has this to say about people working, about idleness. This is 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. He writes, Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness, not according to the tradition that they receive from us. Different tone, isn't it? Really, that's quite a shocking change. It's gone from more and more, may you continue to strive to, we command, and he continues to write, for we hear that some of you are li living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. When we were with you, we gave you this command. Anybody unwilling to work should not eat. Kind of blunt. Now such persons we command to do their work quietly. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Take note of those who do not obey what we say in this letter and have nothing to do with them so that they may be ashamed. Do not regard them as enemies, but warn them as believers. What we see here is there, there comes a time when church leadership does have to go from encouraging people, the first Thessalonians model, to saying, okay, it's time. I'd much rather stick to the first Thessalonians model than, than that second. That gets, ooh, that gets tense. As we read this chapter, it's, I think it's important the way it points out that we are always going to be at differing levels of maturity in the church. It has nothing to do with age. You can grow up or you can grow old, and sometimes they, they line up and sometimes they don't. And... Um, and we're always going to be at differing levels of this. That's just what it means to be human. Uh, there are places, you know, uh, there are things I'm really good at. Uh, at the last church at Green City, they put kind up there. And I've got to tell you, I don't think anyone's ever looked at Andy and thought, you know, he's really kind. And that might be a bit of indictment for me. I mean, that might be the thing I need to work on that's on that list. But we are always going to be working on this list. We're always going to be seeking to grow in our faith, to grow more Christ-like. And as we do this, we'll be walking together, which means that we bear with each other's faults, we encourage each other to grow, and we also celebrate each other's strengths. In, in, in this way that it's not a, doc, a doctor, a patient relationship where you come here so I can fix you, but it's a physical therapy relationship where we gather together to be stretched in our forgiveness, to push our humility, to extend our, our wisdom, so that as we walk together we might grow bit by bit and day by day. And I want to encourage you to take this pretty practically so I have something prepared for you. This is a prayer for you to be able to put in the front of your Bible or wherever you're going to see it every morning. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to look at this list, pick what you are worst at, and put it in that blank. 
And here's the prayer. Heavenly Father, I desire to be more like your Son. Open my eyes so that I may see ways to be more today. I trust that you will show me small ways to do so, and that as I follow you, your lead, these small moments can change my life in great ways. This I pray in the power of your Holy Spirit, whom you send to guide us. You see, if we want to grow in this, it, there's no one great thing you're going to do. But what we can do is attend to small things on a daily basis. For example, forgiveness. Are you ever short with the lady at the checkout line at the gas station? Never? You're all a better person than me. Maybe, maybe you're always good. Maybe you're always forgiving. Let's say that you're... You ever walk out the door and think to yourself, I should have been a little bit more patient, right? What would it take to turn around, go back in, and apologize? Do you do it? Well, that would be a small moment to turn around, go back in, and say, forgive me, I was a bit short. How often do you think someone who's working at a gas station hears that, and how often do you think they should hear it, right? These are the small moments. Forgiving, humility, humility and servanthood. You pray to be more humble and more of a servant. You know what one of the easiest ways to be a servant of this community is? When you're walking along, have open eyes to see trash on the ground. And make the time to stop and pick it up. You're loving your community and you're, and you're helping others just by taking care of our, our land, right? Small things done repeatedly will change us. It is my prayer for each of you and, and for myself that our eyes may be open to the small things that done with great love can change our lives so that we look more like that. Amen.